à l'aise. Voilà. So I've asked Alice, oh, this is a bit loud, I've asked Alice to share, um, and I really, really want you to listen to this because um, I just gave her a passage of scripture to read, and I said, do, do whatever you want out of that passage of scripture. And then she shared me with her notes, uh, shared her notes with me, and everything she has done as, is setting me up to share what I want to share as well. So I'm asking you to listen because the Holy Spirit is trying to say something. All right, so please listen up. Hey, good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alice. I'm normally hidden on the back row somewhere, or I'm running food hampers on a Thursday. So this is a very different setting for me this morning. Um, Phil sent me a passage of scripture, which I'm going to read in full, um, just to give you some context, but I'm going to be focusing on two verses in particular. So it's Ephesians 1, 1 to 7, and I'll read it for you. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And I really want to focus on verses four and five. And three verses come up, uh, three words come up in those verses that really stood out to me. The first thing was love. The second word was predestined. And the third word was adoption. And then it's funny how all the praise and worship was linked to those words this morning. And I really want to focus on the word adopted. Some of you may know, because I've been with many of you for many years, um, but others of you might not. In the physical, as a human, I am adopted. I've got an adopted father. And for years, I struggled with some of the things surrounding that status. You know, where's my real father? Why didn't he want me? Um, have I just been added to a family that... I don't actually belong in because I just come as part of the baggage from my mum. You know, I really struggled with that. And very recently, I've learned about something called adopted child syndrome, which is inherent in anybody who has been adopted. It comes as part of the status. And there's things that children with uh, adopted child syndrome struggle with. Um, some of those things are feelings of rejection, shame, guilt, defiance, problems with identity, breaking the law. And I sat there and wondered and thought, being as we're all adopted into God's family, is there a part of our Christian walk where actually we all struggle with that? Is there something in us that just has that adopted child syndrome deep in our spirit? And I want to encourage us with something today that actually has really spoken to me and really helped me to heal. So looking at those three words, <clears throat> love. The word in the scripture, if you look it back, is agape. It's unconditional love. The word predestined, I'd love to try and pronounce it, but it means foreordained. And the word adoption is huothesia, which comes from huios. For those of you that have been in Bible study on a Tuesday, you'll know what that word means. It means child. So what I want to do is I want to reread verses 4 and 5 with those words brought back to their original breakdown. In unconditional love, he foreordained by holy order that we would be his children through Jesus Christ. Which makes it sound stronger, which makes it sound like it's not just a Bible verse, but actually our lives have meaning. There are two other verses I just want to quickly look at because this really spoke to me and this really touched my heart and it definitely healed something in me that I'd struggled with for years. John 3.16, a very familiar verse for most of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Matthew 3, 17. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And do you know what's interesting? For God so loved the world. And this is my beloved son. The word love is agape in both of those. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then Matthew, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The word is huios. Jesus is viewed in exactly the same light as we are in God's eyes. We're viewed exactly the same. It's not just a case of you've been added in because you're a little bit of baggage that came about from a broken marriage or a broken relationship or an accidental circumstance where actually my parents didn't really plan to have me, but here I am. What am I doing here? This was predestined. And God views each of us in exactly the same light as he views his own son. It's the same word. So it doesn't matter how you got here. It doesn't matter whether you came here through a broken down marriage, a fantastic marriage, terrible parents, wonderful parents. I've been blessed with an adopted or adopt, uh, adopted father, earthly father, that's actually been such a good example of Christ's love to me, and I'm blessed. But not everyone can say that. But irregardless, it doesn't matter. Because I'm viewed in God's eyes exactly the same way as he views Jesus. Father, I thank you for Alice. I thank you for her heart and her passion for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you have took her on a journey. You're continuing to take her on a journey. I thank you that you have placed within her a treasure that is to be shared with the body of Christ. Father, I ask you to just, just do as you say in your word. Order her steps, Lord. Establish her. Take her where she needs to go in her walk with you and help her to become that incredible blessing that she is to the church. Let those words that come out of her mouth take root in people's hearts and flourish and prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Great. Great. <laughs> right. The title, title for my message is Getting to Know Our Heavenly Father. Alice had no idea what I was going to be speaking on. Getting to Know Our Heavenly Father. Last week, David talked about being in him. Being in God, in the Father, in Yahweh. But do we really know who our Heavenly Father is? What do we know about his character? What do we know about how he thinks about us? I'm going to take us on a bit of a journey in Scripture and reveal to us some things about our Heavenly Father. You see, I had an earthly father. My, I'm not adopted. I wasn't adopted. I was born into a family. My family stayed together. My dad, though, was never really ever meant to replace my heavenly father. He was there to do a job, a steward. He used to steward me. He had a role to play out. Sometimes he played out that role well. Sometimes he didn't play out that role very well. But whatever took place in my family, it actually does have an effect on my view and my expectations of my Heavenly Father. It lays an imprint in me, in my, in my mind, in my soul, in my, what do you, whatever you want to call it, your psyche, whatever. It lays an imprint of behaviors and expectations brought down and handed down by my earthly father. And I inadvertently and subconsciously project those expectations onto my heavenly father. And I don't even know I'm doing it sometimes. But I want to go into something about our heavenly father today. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I spoke about something all around Ephesians 1 verse 7, where it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. All talking about Jesus Christ, but it was talking about a specific moment in the history of the whole of creation that had never been done before and never ever will be done again. It was a moment, an event in time that God, the Father, was working towards. Nobody knew about the crucifixion. Two and a half thousand years ago. Nobody understood what it would mean. How it would look. Who was going to go through it. Nobody knew. It was hidden in the heart and mind of the Father. Or we know it in the scripture. It's called the mystery of his will. But that mystery has been revealed to us now. Through Christ. 
But that one moment, and we focus on that moment because in that moment, there is salvation for all who understand what it meant. Every man, woman, and child. It all revolves and centers around that one pivotal moment of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That moment actually had a build-up to it. There was a lot that went into the organization, or the Bible calls it the administration of the fullness of the times. A lot went into it behind the scenes, and it was the Father who was organizing everything. Our Heavenly Father was the mind behind the whole plan of salvation. Let that sink in for a moment. Yours and my heavenly father has been at work for the whole of eternity regarding yours and my eternal future. Building it all up. So I want to look at four truths about our heavenly father. Yes, I didn't start my timer. I don't do this on purpose, honestly. Every time I get up, I say, oh, I'm going to put it on anyway. I'm looking at the clock. Yeah, that's just oh, 20 minutes, is it? Thank you. 20 minutes, see what happens, yeah? <laughs> see if anybody gets saved, yeah? Awesome. Number one. Thank you, Leah. Prompt. Four truths about our Heavenly Father. Number one, He knows me more than anyone else could ever know me. He knows me more than anyone else could ever know me. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 in the first section says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I'm going to get into that in a bit. Right? That, that's a massive scripture there. But before... I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you. This is a great comfort to me. Because whenever I pray, whenever I come before God in my prayer time or just talking to him, I have this wonderful, wonderful comfort blanket that I put around me that says to me, Phil, he knows everything about you. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're planning. He knows your motives, your intents. There is nothing about me my heavenly father doesn't know. Nothing is hidden. And yet, many of us Christians think and actually think that we can hide from God. We think that we can keep things back. And he, don't say it out loud or he'll hear you. He knows me inside and out. He knows every part of my DNA because he formed me in my mother's womb. He knows every single thought I've ever had and probably he knows and he does know every thought I ever will have because that is who he is. He is the almighty God, El Shaddai, the omniscient one. I think that's the right word, is it? Yeah? All knowing. Ephesians 1 4, verse 8. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Romans 8 28, 29, verse 8. Uh, sorry, section A. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This is how much he knows me. This is how much he knows you. Absolutely. And I'm going to put some layers in this. Number two. He loves me more than anyone else could ever love me. More than anyone. My earthly dad, I loved him. I still love him, even though he's not here. I honor him. I thank God for him. But he couldn't tell me that he loved me. 
but I still love him because I know he did. He just wasn't able to say it because of his baggage. But my heavenly father, I just accept it. I accept it. He loves me more than anyone else could ever love me. In fact, when I was getting married to Julie, I prayed for God to bring a woman into my life that would love him more than me. Because I knew that if she loved him more than me, my back's covered. Because she will always do the right thing by me. Because she puts him first. My heavenly father loves me more than anybody else could ever love me. Romans 5, 7 to 8. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone may even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love towards you and I. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Whoa. If you're here for the first time, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you've never become a Christian, put that in inverted commas, all right? I want to tell you that whatever state you're in right now, whatever you've done, said, or wherever you've been, wherever it is, God can never love you more than he does right now. Because his love caused him to die for us when we were the worst of the worst. That was his way of demonstrating this love that we ha he has for us. Because we can't see it, sometimes can't feel it. But we know it's there because he made something happen that was outrageous, absolutely outrageous. He gave his only son to die for us. Romans 8, 39, uh, 38 to 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. So whatever you think is going on in your life, whatever you think somebody else is going to do or has done or what you're going to do, the Bible says that nothing in the whole of this created universe will ever be able to separate you from the love that God has for you. Nothing. You might think of yourself as the biggest mess up in the world. The worst Christian that exists. Nothing will separate you from the love that God has for you. Nothing. And on top of that, he actually wants us to know this love. He wants us to experience it. Let me show you. Ephesians 3, 18 to 19 says that we may be able to comprehend or fully understand with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height to know that word there is ginosko, which means absolutely, totally resolved. To know, that's it. You can't convince me otherwise because I know that I know that I know. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That word knowledge there just means mere intellect. If we don't understand the way that God really loves us, it is just a mental ascent. You just read it in a book. Ah. But that, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The more we mature, the more we grow in our understanding of how much our Heavenly Father loves us, we, we, we grow in our fullness of the spiritual life. While we don't understand it and we don't press into it, we remain emotionally, mentally stunted 
and we can't relate to the people around us the way we should do in Christ. I've experienced this love on a number of occasions, two in particular, probably the most traumatic moments in my life. The first was when I heard the diagnosis that my first son, Cain, was terminally ill. And I'm sat on the floor of my house in Wycourt in Thornhill, and I'm looking at the window. And my heart is breaking. And I'm sat there, and I shut my eyes. I can literally feel the arms of God come around me and touch me. The loving embrace of a heavenly father who cares. The second was similar. My second son, who also had a terminal illness. What I went through, um, I had to take him off life support. I had to take my first son off life support. I had to take my second son off life support. He was being kept alive by oxygen. I had the responsibility as the head of the home and the, the man who was looking after my son to turn the oxygen off. So I turned the oxygen off. And we sat there. He was in his mother's arms. I put my hand on his head. I said, Lord, let him rise up now on wings of eagles. And instantaneously, he died. He went. I went home. I'm lying in the bed. And all of a sudden, I hear the father's voice saying, I know what you feel like. Because I had to let my son go. The father had to let the son go for you and for me. And I knew the love of God. Let me move on. Do we have difficulty when we think about what he's thinking about? <laughs> what does he think of us? Let me read the scripture that most of us will have heard. But his thoughts towards us, and I want to read this, but I want you to understand that he knew us before we were even born. He knew us before the foundation of the world. And he says this, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I don't need to know them. I don't need to work it out. I don't need to understand it. God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are thoughts of peace, shalom. Shalom, total wholeness and well-being. To give you a future and to give you a hope. That is the heavenly father who is watching over us. That's his thoughts. He doesn't have other thoughts because he's eternal in his character. The nature of those thoughts, the intent of those thoughts, thoughts of shalom, peace, not of evil. That is why you can sit back and understand that whatever's going on in your life, if it's designed to hurt, to harm, to steal, kill, and destroy, it's got nothing to do with your heavenly father. Even the way your earthly father treated you in a wrong way has nothing to do with your heavenly father. It's got everything to do with a human being that has a free will and makes choices of their own and has to take responsibility for their own choices. But your heavenly father, does ne he never thinks evil of us. Only good. That's his thoughts. So firstly, he knows me more than anyone else could ever know me. Secondly, he loves me more than anyone else could ever love me. And I'll finish on this point this morning, and hopefully if I get time, I will, I'll finish again. The rest off, yeah? Ephesians, oh, sorry, number three. He has done for me more than anyone else has ever done for me. 
That's how good he is. He has done for me more than anyone else has ever done for me. Right, Ephesians 1, 3 to 4. Thank you, Alice, for for pointing out those scriptures there. That's what I'm focusing on here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We are aware by now, hopefully, that this is written in the past tense, yes? He has blessed us. Yeah? He chose us. Past tense. But I want to dig it a bit deeper so we can go a little bit more into what he's saying. But I'm going to focus on a couple of words first in verse 4. One of the words is holy. That we should be holy. The word hagios. It means to be sacred or most holy. A most holy thing or a most holy one. A saint. That is who God wanted us to be. That's what we should be. And I'm going to say that word, those words should be, because I want to put them into the context here. The next word is blameless. Holy and blameless. Amamos. Unblemished. Without spot or wrinkle. Faultless, unblameable. The Lamb of God, as Alice so Sweetly put it, we are in his image, faultless without spot or blemish. That is the heart of God for every person who comes to him. To be holy and to be faultless without spot or blemish. Then there's a joining of these two verses, verses 3 and verse 4. It's joined... By a compound of two words. Please stay with me. I'm not that intellectual, but it'll make this simple, okay? A compound of two words where it says, just as, just as he chose us. The word there is kathos. From the Greek word kata, meaning down, downward, and throughout. It has a strength to it, a degree of intensity, which brings about a sense of permanence, right? Kata. The second word there is hos, I think it's pronounced like that, meaning as, like, or even as. Even as. Right. This is good. Stay with me. You like this. So kathos, or just as, is used also as a conjunction in grammar, which means it's tying the subject matter of the first verse in verse 3 into verse 4 and is binding them together. Yeah? A conjunction. A word used to connect clauses or sentences to coordinate words in the same clause. Also, the action or an instance of two or more events or things occurring at the same point in time or space. So, the first verse 3, this is the, this is the, <laughs> this is the layman's talk now, right? Confounding us all with stuff. I'm only reading this because I see it on the internet, by the way. I'm not clever, right? <laughs> I study it. Somebody else has done all the hard work. The verse 3 says, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places, even as he chose us before the foundation of the world. He didn't pronounce the blessing when you got saved. I've learned this. He pronounced it when he first thought of you. Before this universe even existed, he knew us. And he pronounced a blessing, a benediction, just like he did in Genesis 1.28. It's the same word, eulogio. In Genesis 1.28, it says, And he blessed them, Adam and Eve, and said, Have dominion. Rule over the whole of the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. As he spoke, the creation of that very fact came into being in the very DNA of Adam and Eve. They became the rulers of the planet, and they became fruitful and multiplied. 
Just like he said, the land come forth from the sea. Let there be lights in the firmament. He did the same thing with Adam and Eve and blessed them and spoke into their lives. This word blessed in Ephesians 1.3 is exactly the same word. So just as he chose us, he pronounced the benediction. Guess what's going to happen? It gets created. Oh, why did he do it? In verse 4, it says that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, in agape. He wanted you and I to be able to stand before him holy and without blame. And he's wanted it ever from the first time he thought of you. Before the foundation of the world. This is how much our Heavenly Father loves us. The words there should be. When you read it, it could sometimes look like this. <laughs> now that I'm saved, I should be holy. I should be blameless. <laughs> I should live like a better Christian. I better get my act together. That's not what it means. The word there should be means to actually exist eternally. Exist eternally. So he pronounced the blessing on us when he knew us that we should exist eternally, holy and blameless before him in love. Oh. This is our heavenly father. Forget your earthly father for a moment. And I don't, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I want about lift your mind on things above. Yeah? Our heavenly father has done all this before the foundation of the world. That's where Hebrews 10, 14. <laughs> the actual creation of that word that he spoke took place in Ephesians 1, verse 7, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, and he called us, I surrendered my life to Christ, and at that moment, he created me holy and blameless. It was preordained. He predestined me. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by one offering, he, Jesus Christ, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Which means that as we receive salvation, we are made holy. <laughs> when you're being sanctified, it means that you're brought to the place of acceptance of Christ. You are set apart and you are made holy. So stop trying to be a better Christian because of the guilt and the shame you feel. Tell the guilt and the shame to get lost. And I'll wrap up on this. You and I have never been the afterthought. Never once have we been the afterthought. We've always been the before thought. The reason for this creation in which we live to exist was to provide for you and I. We are the apple of his eye. Jesus was crucified for us in the eternal plan and purpose of God and our, of our, and our Father before the world even existed. I'll just read this last scripture. Just in verse 20. Focus on verse 20 in, in um, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. It talks about we were purchased or redeemed, not with precious metals, you know, gold and silver, but with the blood of Jesus. We understand that. Ephesians 1, 7, we're redeemed through the blood. Yeah? Look at this in verse 20, though. He, Jesus Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So at the same time that he's thinking of you and me, he's also planned already the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his son. It says, but he was manifested. So he was, the plan was sought, thought out before the foundation of the world, but it was manifested in these last times 
for who? Put yourself in there. God, for God so loved Graham Riley, Linda Shepherd, Gwyn, Calvin, Josh, Karen. For God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son at a certain point in time in creation to die for us, to carry upon himself all the sin of the world, to draw all the judgment for every wrong deed that every human being has ever done. He drew all that judgment to himself and he carried it in his body and he took it to the grave so that you and I can go free. Let's pray. Father, oh, help us grasp this incredible width, depth, height, breadth of your love for us that you demonstrated in Christ when you sent him to this planet to die for our sin, to carry our the judgment to us, he carried it on himself on that cross. Father, help us to grasp this incredible knowledge that goes beyond human, mere understanding that we have, but revelation, Father, revelation. Can I ask everyone just to close your eyes for a moment? I don't know who is here altogether, but maybe you're visiting. Maybe you are still thinking about God, wondering about God. But you've never really ever said, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and taking my sin upon yourself. So with every eye closed, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to help you by just saying this prayer. And if you can say this prayer with me under your breath or whatever, it's just inviting God into your life. Just say this prayer. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming into this world and dying for me personally. Thank you for taking my sin upon yourself and taking it to the cross. Thank you that you loved me so much that you did that. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you are the Son of God. And I invite you into my life. Thank you. Thank you. Every eye closed. I'm asking you right now, if you said that prayer for the first time, where you really meant it, I would like to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you. Just need to know that it's you, so I'm going to count to three. Just raise your arm up when I count to three. One, two, three. Is there anyone here? Thank you, I see your arm. Is there anyone else? Lift it up high if I can't see it. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for that lady who raised her arm. Thank you for her, Lord. Thank you that she actually now belongs to you completely. Thank you that you've promised her from this moment on, you will never leave her, you will never forsake her. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're in her life, you're in her heart, you're in her very being, and you will teach her, and you will guide her, you will lead her, and you will show her just how much she is loved, and just how much you have for her in her future, how much you want to do for her. Thank you for her, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Phil for that word this morning? Wow. So what are we? Number one? Gee whiskers, we forgot already. Love. He knows me more than anybody knows me. 
He loves me more than anybody's ever loved me. And he's done for me more than anybody's ever done for me. There's one more to come. There's probably lots more, but uh, there's one more to come. Powerful word. Don't you love how the Holy Spirit just orchestrates Alice, Carl, Phil, worship team, everything else, to just so, uh, if you walk away out of these doors today and go, oh, I didn't get much today. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where you were. I think we've been blessed this morning. I think we've eaten well. I think we're well fed. We're well fed. Father, I just thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for what you've done for us. I thank you, Jesus, for Riska. I thank you for that valley all the way to the top, all the way up to Bryn Mawr. I thank you, Father. I thank you for Nepal. And I thank you, God, just as Phil highlighted, when we walk in the pattern of who you are, what you made us to be, you said to Adam and Eve, Go forth, multiply, subdue the earth. You said it to Abraham. You said it to Isaac. You said it to Jacob. You said it to David. And Jesus told us. God, when we walk according to that pattern, we see the building and the expansion of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.